Welcome to Beyond the Inbox, an e-commerce podcast brought to you by Drip. In each episode, you'll hear from top e-commerce marketers and founders who will reveal the customer-first strategies they're using to grow their sales, subscribers, and revenue. Now let's get into today's episode. In this episode of Beyond the Inbox, I'm joined by Lisa Mastella, founder and CEO of Bumping Blends, a functional smoothie company designed by dietitians to support various health goals. Lisa shares how she uses personalized quizzes, text messaging, and email automations to engage with customers and build a successful e-commerce brand. She also talks about the importance of founder presence, community building, and continuous experimentation in marketing. Tune in to hear Lisa's insights on building a customer-centric brand with a scrappy mindset. Lisa, welcome to Beyond the Inbox. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to chatting. What is Bumping Blends and how has your background as a dietitian impacted the work you do today? So Bumping Blends are pre-blended frozen smoothie cubes designed to support specific areas of health. So we have smoothies for anxiety, focus, trouble sleeping, stress, uh, sex drive, you name it. We have a smoothie for it. Uh, You just pop them in the blender at home. There's like six little cubes blended up with some water and milk, and you've got a perfect smoothie designed by dietitians every time. And so uh, my background is as a registered dietitian. I have a master's in nutrition and public health. Um, And I just, I was really kind of sick of seeing all these health products out there that are just not actually healthy. Uh, You know, you've got all these brands saying that they're healthy, but they're just packed with like artificial sweeteners and natural flavors and all this stuff. And if it did actually have all of the healthy things with none of the bad stuff, it tasted awful. Um, and so my clients were like, don't, please don't make me use that. <laughs> um, and so I was working at a wellness startup on my maternity leave. Um, and I was making smoothies throughout my whole pregnancy, actually throughout my whole life um, to sort of hack biohack my body before biohacking was like a thing. Um, and a lot of dietitians do this too, just because we kind of know how foods work in the body in a way that the average person doesn't. Um, and so I just, you know, it was my husband and my friends, family were all kind of saying like, you could sell these smoothies. They're really delicious and they really work. Um, and then the idea for Bumps and Blends was born. I want to take you back. I, was doing some research for this episode and there's a period in the company's life that really stuck out for me. This is an excerpt from another interview. When COVID hit, I lost my entire staff, my supply chains, my ingredients, my personal nanny, my shipping center, and my methods all without notice. (laughs) For six months, I woke up at 4 a.m. to head to our kitchen and blend and package smoothies before my husband had to start work so I could be home by 9 a.m. to watch our daughter. Then after his work day was over at 5 p.m., I'd start my work for the day and work till 12 a.m. and do bath and bedtime with my daughter only to get up at 4 a.m. all while pregnant. Can you take us back (laughs) to that period? I don't want to. (laughs) Um, That was a rough period for us. COVID, the beginning of COVID was, was an amazing period for us, but it was really challenging. Uh, it was amazing in the sense that we just so happened to have a few influencers talking about us that, that made a really big impact on our business. Um, and everyone being at home and frozen and, you know, it, things were going really well for us business-wise. So we, business was booming. Um, but I was also in my first trimester of pregnancy. Um, and luckily, you know, the first trimester of pregnancy, I don't know if you know, is just vomiting and exhausted all the time. But then the second trimester of pregnancy, you just have this like insane energy. And a lot of moms spend that energy, like, you know, getting the house ready for baby. And so when I was doing that intense, like, you know, four hours a night of sleep, I was in my second trimester for the most part. And so I had like superhuman mom energy and I just funneled it toward bumping. Um, But for the first few weeks, I was still in that like puking, exhausted phase. So it was a lot of, uh, uh, just trying to suppress that. Um, but yeah, that was a really interesting time for us. And it was definitely a a major test to bump in because so many businesses went under it, especially small bootstrapped businesses like ours. You know, we didn't have a huge team. We didn't have fancy investors, nothing to get us through. And so up until that point, 
I had always prided myself on hiring stay at home moms. That was kind of our shtick at the time of like, you know, our entire manufacturing team, fulfillment team, warehouse teams, everything were stay at home moms who would come in after they dropped their kids off at school and then leave by 2 p.m. to pick up their kids. And I loved that model because I feel like stay at home moms are often a really overlooked workforce. Um, and of course, like that Friday when everyone got the notice that all schools were closed and now kids are sitting at home on Zoom, I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say what I want to say, but um, it was it was very scary and very bad. But luckily, you know, my husband and I, we put our heads together. You just have to make it work. You know, when you run a small business, when you're an entrepreneur trying to build a startup, you just have to make it work. Um, if you believe in the product and you believe you'll get through it. And we did. Um, we were able to, act, it actually ended up being so incredible for our business too, because I was like, okay, who, while I'm, I'm picking up the slack of everyone, not the slack, but, you know, picking up the empty space of, of needing, somebody needs to blend these smoothies. So I'll be there blending. And then at night I'll figure out how to build a staff back. Um, and luckily within, not luckily, horribly within a few weeks of COVID happening, but somewhat luckily for Bunk and Blends, people were getting laid off like crazy, especially restaurant workers, because it was just looking like restaurants were just not going to open back up. Um, and same goes for LA. We're in LA, a lot of actors were out of work and, and struggling. Um, and so I turned to out of work actors and waiters and waitresses and hostesses from restaurants, um, often overlapped with each other. But, um, and I hired, um, a few waiters and waitresses from Nobu and who were laid off uh, or if they weren't laid off, they were just like on pause while Nobu was closed uh, as well as a couple of chefs uh, who were out of work. And I, those people changed our business completely. Like to have a, a real professional chef blending our smoothies and giving their feedback and making tweaks here and there, it made our product sensational. Um, and then the people who had worked at Nobu were able to kind of take a few things that Nobu had done right and wrong and apply it to our kitchen. So, you know, some of the people I heard there, one of them ended up becoming our operations director because she was so fantastic. Um, Nobu was really sleeping on her as a wait, as a hostess. Um, and so it, was, it ended up being so great for us. It's a fascinating story and super inspiring to hear. I know balance is very important to you. And I wanted to ask you how difficult it must have been to strike a healthy work-life balance during that period. Um, you know, it was definitely an all hands on deck situation uh, with my husband and I and our kids. But, you know, if you balance is something else, you really just have to prioritize that. You have to make sure that you have hard and fast boundaries um, and that you're able to delegate and let things go when you can, so that you can pick up space for more important things. You know, for me, spending time with my kids, seeing those milestones, being a part of it, breastfeeding, like all that is, is are non-negotiables for me. Um, and so I never want my kids to feel like mommy's ignoring them for work. And that's like my, you know, my driving force is like, you know, my kids are only this age for right now. It's so fleeting. It moves so fast. Um, and I never, ever want them. Well, one, I really don't pers selfishly. I don't want to miss out on these times. Are you kidding? They're the cutest things ever. And then pretty soon they're just going to like, not want to hug me in public and, you know, give me attitude. I don't, I don't want to miss this, but also for them, like, I don't want them to ever have memories that like mommy was working and she couldn't play with us. Um, and so there were other things I had to cut out in my life to, to make space. But when it comes to like balance, you have to just like set really firm boundaries um and just remind yourself also like even if you run a really exciting startup even if you're running the most successful smoothie business in the world or whatever startup you're running that is changing lives and everything it's it's just a startup like it's just a company it's just a business you know we're not i'm not putting people on the moon i'm not like curing world hunger i i can i can get to that email later like, you know, they can wait. And so like, that's my biggest thing. It's like, e you email me, it will take me two weeks to reply. I don't know how long it took me to reply to your email about this podcast. Like, it can take a long time. But like, I don't care. I'm spending time with my kids. I really admire Sorry that. Sorry to everyone I'm... who's emailed me. No, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's such an important point to, to emphasize. I'm a dad too. And my son is four and a half going on five. And 
I totally agree. Those moments are fleeting and it's something that you really have to hold on to and the work will always be there when you get back to it. Yeah, my daughter's like, yeah, right in between four and a half and five. And so you definitely know, like it literally you blink and they go from this like newborn to a cute toddler to now they're like this child with very strong opinions and all that. So it's 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 crazy how fast it flies. It is. Switching gears a little bit, let's move to the present. There is so much I want to talk about when it comes to how you're marketing the brand. I want to start on site. The first thing you notice when you go on the website is almost a gif in the bottom right-hand corner of you waving at the visitor. Can you tell us more about (laughs) Tolsty and how you're using it to engage on-site visitors? It's a very effective tool. Uh, Tolstor is great, especially for small businesses with founders who are very much the face of the company, um, which I think if you run a small business, especially any kind of CBG brand, um, direct to consumer, if you're the founder, you need to be the face of the business. Um, and I, I'm someone I really hate being on camera. Like nothing makes me more uncomfortable than like filming something like that tool story. It, it just, yeah, I, I hate it. And I hate being in TikToks and I, I just, I, I hate all of it, but everyone I've worked with on the marketing side, everyone who can see our numbers and understand it knows that like when customers see me or hear me talking about something, it just goes off like gangbusters. And if it's anyone else talking about it, it doesn't, it flops. So um, I thought, how can we apply that to the website? Um, Because on Instagram and stuff or TikTok, people like to see me talking about the product and, and hearing my story, um, podcast, et cetera. And, and so I was like, how can we bring that to the site? And Tolstor is great for small businesses too, because it's super inexpensive. It's really, it's, it's like, I think 20 bucks a month or something super small. Um, and you can, you can like, I think especially a lot of CPG brands, they want to take their customer on the journey. Like if I could just literally sit next to everyone who lands on our website and like hold their hand and kind of explain things, I would. Like I feel like when when people interact with us at an event or something like that, like they get it in a way that not everyone does when they're just landing on the website. Um, Because people, you know, they land on the website, they're, what is this? How did I get here? And they might leave. But you have the founder literally waving to them in a corner like, hey, I'm right here. I'm here to help. And it's like I'm holding your hand through the process if you're a bit confused, especially like we have a subscription. You got to select flavors. It's not like a click here. Like it's not like Amazon where it's like buy now, click, done. You have to select flavors. You have to think about it. And it's a big purchase too. It's not cheap. On the subject of engaging visitors, you also have this quiz. And it's very common in e-commerce to have quizzes, but I feel like you do it really well. How are you using Tolstoy with quizzes and what is the goal with the quiz? So the quiz was something I wanted like from the get-go. Before I built the website, before I had the company, I was like, I want a quiz. I want a quiz. I want it now. Uh, And I couldn't afford it because being on Shopify and having developers build out a custom quiz was like hmm, more than I had invested in the business originally. And so I was like, my goal, as soon as we hit, I think my goal was like, as soon as we hit 100k in revenue or something when we first launch i'm going to invest in you know building this out uh and so the quiz was always super important to me um and yeah now everyone does quizzes and i like to think they all got it the idea from me but probably not um but the quiz i wanted because we are not just a smoothie company like we are not just giving you like razzmatazz and strawberry banana and sending you on our way our smoothies are functional and that's what sets them apart. They are designed by dietitians to work for your body. And so if you're like just ordering them because you love the peanut butter cup, that's great. Like our cookie dough flavor will blow your mind, but you know, they're also functional. And so if you're someone who struggles with like digestion issues or headaches or low sex drive, like we have smoothies that will literally help you. They'll change your life. Um, like we've had customers say that like our sleep smoothie is better than Ambien for them. And they were able to get off taking Ambien every night because they switched to our smoothie. And it's like, yes, that is what this is about. And the quiz really puts that front and center for you because you get to personalize the experience. You get to have the hand holding of a dietitian next to you. You just select what you need support with and we will curate an exact list of the smoothies we recommend for you. Um, and from a marketing perspective, 
we funnel you right into checkout. Like it, I, that sounds terrible, but like, you know, once you have your recommendations, it does take you right into checkout, um, which was tough because when I first built the Shopify site, uh, like I said, we're a very scrappy business. We've never taken investor funding. I invested 18 K in the beginning of the business to just get it off the ground in my garage. And that's that, like, we just spend what we make and we stay in the black. Um, and so for me, built, moving to Shopify and building out the quiz and everything, I could only afford like a freelance developer who was like really scrappy. And he was like, I could kind of make this work. And originally the quiz couldn't take you to checkout because I could not afford it. Like plain and simple, I couldn't afford it. And at the time I was pregnant, I had a toddler. I was like, I'm not going to like take out a loan or something for this. We're just going to make this work. And so the quiz didn't take you to checkout. Um And then it eventually we like upgraded (laughs) uh, for it to take you through checkout and it made a huge difference. (laughs) Were you asking for the email and that's where the journey ended or what was the end of that journey before the quiz originally? Yeah. So for the quiz originally, we gathered the email and the name. That is like also a huge part of the quiz. It is our main email collector. Um, So in order to take the quiz and see the results, you need to input your email. It is our biggest email junk collector because people just write like F off. I don't want to give you my email at gmail.com. And then they get their quiz results, but that's fine. It's also our huge, like it is, um, let's see what it is. Uh, It collects 7.5 times more emails than all of our other email collection efforts combined to put that number into perspective. So our pop-ups, our on-site subscription, anything else we use to collect emails, the quiz collects 7.5 times more emails. Like that's not a made up number. I just ran the numbers just now. Um, And so it is like the primary way we get people's contact info. And then we put them, of course, once you finish the quiz, sure, we take you right to checkout. But if you don't immediately check out, within three minutes, you're getting an email like, hey, your quiz results. And then 15 minutes later, like, here's a discount code, quiz 15. And then the next day, like, your discount code's expiring. And then, you know, and then they're in our funnel. Then we just welcome them into the family because, you know what, they took the time to fill out a whole quiz on our website. They're interested. Um, But there's just something keeping them from checking out. I want to come back to email in a moment. Going back to the pop-up, I see that you're asking for the mobile number. And I wanted to ask Mm -hmm. how and why you're using SMS. SMS has, uh, well, one, SMS is so affordable as well. You know, a lot of email partners, they can be a bit pricey. And, you know, it's hard to make those numbers work unless you have like a massive email list and it's really, you know, worth it. Um, But... SMS is much more lower hanging fruit in terms of like, it is super affordable and it is all the rage right now. And everyone's really into it. Uh, And we also, I'm going to sound like such a jerk. We also did text messaging before the text messaging messaging apps were like even around. And it was a thing like before the launch of PostScript, before the launch of Attentive and Emotive, all those, or at least before they were popular, anyone knew what they were. We did text messaging because that was another part of the nutritionist dietitian offering of ours was that every subscription came with your own 24 seven nutritionist. And that's still the case. We used to do it manually with Google voice. Wow. Um, it did not, you know, it was just not scalable or sustainable, but we did it. Um, back in 2018, 2019, we were literally texting our customers with Google voice. Um, which is just so funny to me. Uh, But now luckily we use, we use an app for it and um, it's great. I think it's a really fun way to interact with your customers. And I think customers are looking for that. You know, the email marketing can come off as marketing a bit sometimes if you do it wrong, if you do it right, it can be much better than that. But SMS is an easy way to interact with your customers in a really natural, organic way. If you do it right, if you do it wrong, it's really annoying, but we use SMS as a way to poll and survey our customers quite a bit, you know, 
hey, we're bringing in a new flavor for spring. Would you want to see an orange smoothie or a coconut smoothie? And then it just gets them engaging with you. You know, they're replying to you and, and going back and forth. Um, we don't do it as like spammy marketing stuff. When we do have a big campaign or like a limited time product, we will push it on SMS. But um, we just like to talk to our customers. It's like a really fun way to engage. Are you getting a lot of surprising feedback when you're sending these text messages, things that you wouldn't have considered otherwise? Nothing too surprising. I am always surprised when people engage with it like certain texts will send will just like go off like gangbusters like getting like thousands of responses um and then certain texts just crickets uh and so it's interesting to see what our customers are interested in um and i'm always surprised to see i'm not always surprised but a lot of the times i'm surprised to see like certain poll answers where i'm like really everyone loves that flavor like are we sure and then they like yeah so that's really fun to see um and it's just also cool to kind of, we're small enough that I can kind of know some customers. Um, we used to like, I used to know every customer's full name and address. It was very like up until we had like 50 customers back in 2019. Uh, and then once we got to have like, you know, 500, 1000, whatever, I, I don't have all their names, but sometimes randomly I'll recognize a name. Like maybe what I, who I recognize are the customers who have caused trouble with uh, support. Um, so if a customer is like raising hell with the support team and they're so angry and we're getting like profanity lashed at us, I'll be looped in. Um, and then randomly, like I always, it's fun to see like that customer is then replying to our text message with her favorite flavor for spring. And I'm like, seriously, you just, you wreaked havoc on our CX team and you're just, uh, telling us your favorite flavor that you want to come back. So that's sometimes fun to see on text. I want to go back to email because mm -hmm. we talked previously and you shared some really interesting automations that you're using. We talked a little bit about cart abandonment. I know you have a welcome flow where you're introducing the brand and you and what others are saying and the quiz. What other automations are running the business? So the quiz flow is our biggest one because it's where we're getting the most customers. And the welcome flow is really for only the customers that sign up with the pop-up or um, the on-screen thing. And then um, we have our abandoned cart, of course, and our browse abandoned flow, which is great. Um, we also have a win back flow um, for anyone who's canceled a subscription. We have a separate win back flow for if you cancel a subscription above a certain price point. Um, so, for instance, if you had a subscription for under $100 and you had it for only like a month or two, we have one win back flow for you because I can kind of tell who you are. Um, and then if you were someone who had like a $200 subscription for six months or more, and then you canceled, I have a different win back flow for you. Um, and so we have just different flows, just targeting our customers in different ways. Um, we have a pretty robust loyalty program. So we have some good flows around our loyalty program, encouraging people to use points. Um, and then we have a flow for uh, upgrading your subscription. So if you're someone who's ordering our smallest bundle for under $100 every two weeks, but you've like received three bundles, you clearly like it, you're in there, you're updating your flavors, you haven't skipped a box or tried to cancel, we have like a, a flow for you to upgrade you to a bigger monthly bundle so that we are spending less on shipping and you are spending less on smoothies. So it doesn't make sense to get seven smoothies every other week when you can get 14 monthly for the same, for like a lower price. You also talked about running marketing experiments, and I'm curious, are there any marketing experiments that you've run recently that have surprised you or maybe? Yeah, um, marketing experiments. Yeah, we are, I think part of our success, and some people are going to really hate that I say this, so I'm sorry. Part of our success is that we were never big on meta ads. Like the Facebook, Instagram ads, that were insane in 2017 to 2019, where like any average Joe could throw a few hundred bucks at meta ads and all of a sudden you've got a million dollar business. Um, we never took advantage of that. 
And at the time I was really pissed about that because I was just like, oh, we could be this $10 million company if I just paid the meta gods. But um, we never did. Uh, and part of that is just, I, I really didn't understand it. And I didn't like throwing money at something I didn't understand. Um, but now I'm really grateful for it because those companies relied very heavily on those ads. Um, and they're all just floundering now. <laughs> a lot of them are, or they went under because they, their only way to survive was their, their cap. Um, and their, you know, the, the, the meta ads being successful. And then when meta ads started doing their thing, they all kind of like didn't know what to do. And so I've always made sure that every quarter we have some new different strange marketing initiative that is might work and it might not but i usually nowadays i set aside 10 to 15 grand each quarter actually no 20 20 to 25 grand each quarter to experiment with something different something strange something that might totally fail and we will never see that 25 grand again um and so for instance maybe it's paying macro influence, you know, paying influencers with over 5 million followers and seeing how that goes. Maybe it's paying smaller bloggers to blog about us and see how that goes. Maybe it's some different SEO technique. Maybe it's um, inbox insert trade with other small businesses. Maybe it's paid inbox inserts with some massive business. You know, whatever it is, I try to set aside money each quarter to try something we have never done before. And to be totally okay if it flops. Um, and it, it does kind of suck sometimes because if we are spending that like 25 grand on something in a quarter and it flops hard, um, that can really affect our numbers. And that kind of stinks. But I feel like it's really important to continuously be experimenting with marketing because if you rely too heavily on one marketing channel, um, what if it's, what if it fails? What if something horrible goes wrong with it? And then you're just screwed. So I kind of like to know, um, it's a good way for me to learn too, because I can know what works and what doesn't and why did that work? And why did it didn't like, for instance, with the macro influencers, we just did that, um, this past quarter and we've had macro influencers talk about us before, but we've never paid them to, um, it's always, you know, we've had Chrissy Teigen, Amanda Klutz, like all these big people talking about us, but we've never actually been like, here's money to talk about us because I I always felt like that wasn't organic um but this quarter we did uh just to tinker with it and one influencer with just a million followers brought in like 70 sales which is pretty good and then the other influencer with almost 8 million followers brought in two sales <laughs> it's like they did the same thing they posted about the same product in the same way and they had the engagement as well was um, the almost 8 million follower influencer had great engagement, 10 times that of the 1 million follower one, but only two sales. And so now I'm like, I get to dig in and experiment and be like, what, what was the difference here? Who is the audience? Like, cause that can tell us a lot about our customers. So that's kind of what I meant by <laughs> experimenting. Yeah, it's it's super interesting and it's so funny what you say about influencers having these large followers, but those followers don't necessarily translate into customers, which is what it's about when you're paying influencers to promote your brand. I'm just being mindful of time wrapping up soon and mm -hmm. I have in my notes here, I wanted to ask you about community and what community means to you. It's important to a lot of founders and coming full circle in the beginning of the call, we were talking about you being the face of the brand. How do you put all of this together? That's a good question. I don't always do it super successfully. I've seen brands that do it wonderfully um, and build a really strong community, which is so fun to see. And, and it's fun to kind of not copycat, but just learn from. Um, but I think that, you know, when you have the email marketing, the text message marketing, the social media, the founder's face and story, uh, the website, and then like the loyalty program, all of that. And you have the inbox experience. Um, you have to wrap it up with a bow. You have to make sure it all ties together and that you have emails about the loyalty program. You have text messages about the Instagram giveaway. You have the founder's story in the box somehow. You have the contact info for the 24-7 nutritionist in the box. Like it all has to sort of connect 
And the way I do that is honestly with a whiteboard or just like paper. I have to be able to draw out the web, tie it all together and make sure that it's all being addressed and organized um, in a way that makes sense for the customer journey. Um, And I don't always do it successfully at all. I have a lot always to, I always have a running to-do list of how to improve this. Um, And we're constantly working on making it better. But I think that like knowing the customer experience, polling your customers, surveying it, making sure that like, because we have customers like who didn't even know we had a loyalty program or didn't even know we had a blog or didn't even know the founder story. Like to find those customers and figure out how that happened, I think is really important. Well, this, this has been a fascinating conversation. Where can our listeners go to learn more about Bumpin' Blends? Bumpin'Blends.com or Instagram Bumpin' Blends. Perfect. Well, thanks again for taking the time to join us, Lisa. And thank you so all much. All the best in the future with Brandt. All right. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. You've been listening to Beyond the Inbox, an e-commerce podcast brought to you by Drip. If you enjoyed the episode, it would mean the world to me if you would subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. Thanks for listening.